Good Easter evening. Thank you so much for joining us for our evening service tonight. Appreciate everyone that was able to be with us during the worship service this morning. For those of you who are able to join by live stream uh, this morning as well, thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate everybody joining us tonight. Uh, like I said, we're hoping, we're just gradually kind of watching things and kind of setting tentative dates to get things kind of back into a more normal flow. Hopefully here 1st of May, we'll be able to get back into Sunday school. Really looking forward to that, excited about it. Uh, but tonight, we're going to continue on as we celebrate Easter and just the wonderful uh, gift that we've been given in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, again, we're going to be kind of looking in a, a little bit of a strange place, I guess, for an Easter message. Uh, but let's go to Genesis chapter number 3. Genesis chapter number 3, as we, look, as we look at this thought of look at what grew in a garden. Look at what grew in a garden. Genesis chapter number 3, we'll start reading in verse number 1. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew what, that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I just come to you now, asking that you just use me to share the truths that you've burdened my heart with. May it be a blessing and a help, and we'll just give you the praise for it all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Now I know, like I said, this may seem like a strange place, uh, to go to for an Easter message. But the truth is, in many respects, there's no place more appropriate than where we've started tonight. Uh, in verse 15, as God curses the serpent, we see the first gospel message. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy head and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, the bruising of the heel of Christ occurred when Christ allowed himself to be tortured and killed as he hung on the cross. But hallelujah and thank God, the crushing of Satan's head was accomplished three days later when Christ arose victorious over Satan, death, and hell. As I was meditating and praying about all of those things, God burdened my heart with this particular thought, and that is look at what grew in a garden. Now notice with me, first of all, here in Genesis chapter number 3, there in verses 1 through 7, we see the Garden of Eden, and there we see the growth of sin and rebellion. As I've told you before, I'm fully convinced that there's no doubt that Adam was standing next to Eve when Satan uh, offered the fruit uh, to her. Uh, and that Adam, the Bible tells us very plainly, that Adam wasn't deceived, but Eve was. In 1 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse, verse 14, the Bible says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. The Bible tells us here that Eve was deceived by the clever lies of Satan. But Adam heard the words and he wanted that promise of power that, uh, and wisdom that Satan offered here. He, he knew. He knew that it would mean death. But the desire to have that knowledge was more, that was promised was more important in the eyes of Adam than the consequences. He was willing to give up eternal blessings for the lure of a temporary pleasure. And so he did nothing to stop Eve uh, from taking of the fruit first. And then he willingly took the fruit himself. And in that moment, there in the Garden of Eden, sin and rebellion and fear began to grow. And like a weed, the Bible says, it would take over and infect the entire world. Romans chapter number 5 and verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for they all have sinned. That intrusive weed continued to grow, and it grew so fast that in 1,600 years, just a little over that, God had to destroy the world with the flood. 
leaving only uh, Noah and his family and then the other representative animals that were there on the ark. But even after they came off the ark, sin continued to grow just like a weed, just like you have in your yard or whatever else. It came right back. And God allowed that sin, uh, that weed of sin, to grow and infect things in such a way that the Bible says that in the fullness of time, when sin had manifested itself in every way possible, God sent His Son, born of a woman, that promised seed all the way back in Genesis chapter number 3, and, and to finally deal with the problem of sin. And that takes us to the next garden, and that's the Garden of Gethsemane, where before we see the growth of sin and rebellion, here in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see perfect surrender. In John chapter number 18, in verse number 1, the Bible says, When Jesus had spoken these words, He went forth with His disciples over the brook Kedron, where was a garden into the which He entered and His disciples. And then in Matthew chapter number 14, in verse 32, the Bible says, And when they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and He said to His disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. Now, it was here in the Garden of Gethsemane, that Christ would pray that prayer, not my will, but thine be done. You have to understand that the, that the word Gethsemane in Hebrew means the press. And what it was specifically talking about was an olive press that was used to squash uh, the olive berries to get the olive oil. And what would happen is, is you would take a bag full of olives, you would lay them down in a particular uh, a little uh, a, a drain or cut off area, docked up area. You would set that there and there was a drain on one end of it. You'd put that bag in there and then you would lay heavy stones upon that bag and, uh, and you would press and you'd get the best uh, extra virgin oil and then you'd lay another stone and the next layer of oil would come out and you would keep laying stone upon stone upon stone uh, on that bag until there was nothing left. Nothing was coming out. The last oil that would come out would be brackish and, and thick and almost muddy from the seed particles that had got captured into it. And so you would press until there was absolutely nothing less, uh, or left. And Christ Himself spent time in there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And He was being pressed on all sides at that very moment. In John chapter number 13 through 16, he tells the disciples there what he wants for them as believers because that was pressing on his heart and pressing on his mind. In John chapter number 17, he prays for the whole church because again, that was pressing upon him. It was something that he wanted them to know. Not only that, but as a man, he dreaded the events of the next several hours. Now, don't get me wrong. Christ did not fear death for he had already said destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. But as a man, he dreaded the pain, the humiliation, the scourgings, for he was as much man, the Bible teaches us, as if he had never been God. But ultimately, that cup that he was so uh, dreading was the cup of the separation, of his separation from the Father. Never had there been a time in all, even before, etern even before the earth was created, Never had there been a time when the fellowship between God the Father and God the Son was not there. When Christ prayed at the resurrection of Lazarus, He said, Father, I thank Thee that Thou hast heard me, and I knew that Thou hearest me always. But in a few hours as He hung there on the cross, Christ knew that God the Father would have to turn His back upon His Son as He judged the sin of the world in Him and that He would have to break that fellowship with Him, the beloved fellowship that He had with the Son. He knew, Christ knew, that there would come a moment when He would feel unspeakable emptiness and He would, and, and he would cry out from the cross, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? But as Christ prayed here in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Garden of Surrender. We see Him pray to God, Not my will, but Thine be done. Christ surrendered His glory to come to earth as a babe and walk as a man. And Christ surrendered His will that He could make a way for my salvation and for yours. But then that brings us to the next garden. 
and that's the Garden of Calvary, where there we see salvation. Now, the first thing you have to ask, I know many people are asking, what do you mean the Garden of Calvary? What are you talking about? Well, in John chapter number 19 and verse 41, the Bible says, Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, where, where, wherein was never man yet laid. And it was there in that garden, as he hung upon a tree, that grew our salvation for both you and for me. I worked with a man years ago who was a certified master gardener. And he grew any number of flowers, but his passion, the thing that he loved more than anything else, was growing tomatoes. And that year that we worked together, I probably ate more tomatoes than I have in my entire life. But as much as he enjoyed the fruit of his labors, the happiest that you would see him was right as things began to bud and right as things began to grow. Just the fact that he could see so early on that his labors were worth the time and worth the effort caused him tremendous joy. And as we read this morning in Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse number 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. While no human being can begin to appreciate the magnitude of the suffering of Christ, I do know that when Christ cried, it is finished, it wasn't a cry of defeat, it was a cry of joy, and it was a cry of victory. But then we also see the next thing that grew in the garden, and that's again the garden of Calvary, but here we're going to the tomb that was in that same garden, and that's assurance. If you go over to John chapter number 20, and we start reading in verse number 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, and unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and that's John, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre, so they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooped, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulchre and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. And for as yet they knew not the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. I don't think that there are words any more beautiful than the ones that John make regarding himself there in verse number 48. He saw and then he believed. But here's the thing that I think is amazing. What John saw was nothing. Nobody. No evidence of a crucifixion. No evidence of a burial other than the grave clothes that were lying there about. But because of that, because when he looked in, he didn't see any broken promises. Because he looked in, he didn't see any bragging devil. Because when he looked in, he could see that what Jesus Christ had said was true. He got the assurance that he needed. And the Bible says he believed. It's been said many times that the stone wasn't rolled away so that Christ could get out. But the stone was rolled away so that his disciples and followers could get in and behold the wonderful fulfillment of all that he had said. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 1, says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, He was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, He was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. 
For I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. Now, if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Here in this chapter, Paul gives us his classic defense of the necessity and the meaning of the resurrection. But it all starts, if you go back to verse number 1, it all starts with the gospel and grace. He says that the gospel, the good news that we have, revolves around the simple truth that the stone was rolled away and Jesus was not there. He talks about the record of the resurrection in verses 1 through 4, and then the witnesses of the resurrection in verses 5 through 8, and the impact that the resurrection had on his life because it was the beginning of his understanding of the grace of God in verses 9 through 11. Then in verses 12 through 19, Paul deals with the necessity of the resurrection and states emphatically there in verse number 17, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter number 2, again, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If the tomb had still contained the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we would be of all men most miserable. But because the stone was rolled away and the tomb is empty, we have access to the amazing grace of God and can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that because He lives, we can face tomorrow. Warren Wearsby, in a little book that I have of his, a devotional book called Life Sentences, says this, The record of the Bible begins in the Garden of Eden where our first parents ate the fruit of the forbidden tree and brought sin and death into the human race. The story climaxes in a garden city called heaven where the citizens of the city eat the fruit of the tree of life that grows along the banks of the river of life. The Bible opens with the garden of Eden and closes with the garden city of heaven. It goes from sin and death to holiness and life. What caused the change? Between those two gardens is the garden of Gethsemane where the Son of God prayed, not my will, but yours be done, and went forth courageously to die on a cross. Because Jesus rose and died again, the curse caused in the first garden has been overcome. The last book in the Old Testament ends with the word curse in Malachi 4, 6. But in the last book of the New Testament, we read no longer will there be any curse. The gift of eternal life is available to all who put their trust in Jesus. The Bible records this remarkable story so that you and I may read it, believe it, and experience all that God has for us. What grew in a garden? In the first garden, we saw the rise of the weeds of sin and rebellion. But God in His mercy allowed His Son to suffer in a garden so that we might understand submission. He allowed Him to die in a garden so that we might have life. And he allowed him to rise from the dead in a garden so we could be assured of his love and forgiveness toward us. As you see the flowers of spring growing in the gardens right now, let that be a reminder that Easter is about life in a garden as well. And one day, because of all that's happened on the gardens here on earth, we'll be living in that garden city of God. Revelation 22 Verses 1 and 2 says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, 
and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Thank God for what grew in a garden. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for the time that we've been able to spend in your word on this Easter Sunday. I pray that the messages have been a help and an encouragement and a blessing. And Father, we're just excited about what you want to do in the days ahead. We ask it all in the sweet and precious name of Jesus. And amen. And amen. Don't forget, this Wednesday night we'll be gathered back. And unless something changes, we should be wrapping up this topic around what the Bible says about UFOs and aliens as we really look at what's going on with these so-called abductions and some of the sightings that people have seen. So I pray it'll be a blessing and, a, and an, again, an encouragement to us this Wednesday night. I uh, hope you can be here with us. We are having services on Wednesday night in person and looking forward to wrapping up that particular part of our study. All right, God bless you. Hope you have a great day. See you soon.